Good morning, and I'm really honored to be able to address your session uh, from the perspective of the businesses, because so far it was a line of the policymakers and the politicians. And now it's the time, I believe, that we say a few words about uh, what the operators, uh, the future users of the line expect, and what are the funding priorities also for them. Uh, yes, I'm uh, uh, representing here the community of European railway infrastructure companies. Uh, that's the, the major association uh, representing the businesses uh, of the railway vis-à-vis -vis the policymakers in Brussels, so vis-à-vis -vis the European Parliament, uh, the European Commission and the Council. Uh, we have uh, in our membership really the majority of the infrastructure managers, the passenger operating businesses as well as the freight, uh, not only in the EU, but also in the candidate and associate countries. I'm really pleased to say that uh, with regards to the Baltic space, Baltic space, all the major companies, so the Estonian Railways, the, the Latvian Railway, Lithuanian Railways, as well as, and I'm really happy to have in front of me uh, Timor Iimäki, as well as the Rail Baltica are belonging to the membership of the CR. Because it's our interest to, to work with the policymakers on the conditions that will rail making a value that making rail to deliver and that will fulfill the, the principle, I would say, statement that we are now going to sell towards the new policymakers, the new members of the European Parliament that are going to be elected, and the new commission, a new commissioner, especially the transport commissioner that we are going to see later this year in Brussels, which says the customer and the society first. Because all what we are doing, Rail Baltica included, obviously, needs to serve the customer, needs to serve the society. We are not building it for ourselves. We, of course, like and love the railway, but we have to make it a railway that is good for the society. As I said, that we have uh, the, the major players on the European railway market in the membership, and uh, we, we work very closely also with the European Parliament. And since it is the fact that I can, I'm even pleased to say that two, two days ago in Brussels, we have organized kind of the pre-event for Rail Baltica. We had an event which is called the Rail Freight Forum. That's the establishment of the members of the Trunk Committee of the European Parliament, uh, chaired by your other friend of the Rail Baltica, Michael Kramer. I really regret that he's not with us today because he is the promoter on the side of the Trunk Committee, next to Pietri Sarvama, who is with us today. So you two are the ones who are really making the real uh, push for the Rail Baltica in Brussels. And uh, now it's a plea to everybody. Please help us to elect the new members of the European Parliament that will be again the rail enthusiasts and again the promoters, the, uh, the, the railways and, uh, and the Rail Baltica specifically. Now, to talk about uh, uh, the rail sector funding priorities. If you allow me, a lot has been said about the, the expectations of the passenger services because the Rail Baltica is going to be a high speed line. But it will have the dual use, as said a number of times, and it, will, and it should be used for freight quite heavily. And we need to make it used for freight. And I will <coughs> quote now Henry Gololay, who said, and I, probably not for the last time now, let's push for the model shift. I mean, I'm really pleased to hear you know, this word of model shift, which for the last few years was more or less the forbidden word because of the strong road lobby. Huh? So I'm glad, I'm glad to, to hear again that we, uh, to see uh, and hear again that we can talk about it, model shift, and why so? This is the figure of the projected uh, growth of the volumes of cargo in Europe. And it's between 2018 and 2030 estimated to 30% of the volume. If we will be distributing those volumes amongst all the transportation modes evenly, it will mean that uh, on, the number, on the side of the road, we will most probably see up to one million of the trucks on the roads on top of what we have today. Just for a comparison, that's, uh, that's the, I don't know whether we can read it, but it's more or less the road market or the road truck market in Germany. So if you have already an experience with uh, the roads being congested by, by the trucks and by, by the cars, we will see that even more on a daily basis. So it's clear that this is not sustainable and we have to, we have to move, we have to move really the cargo from the, from the road to rail. But it's not going to happen automatically, obviously, because uh, if we will be just sitting back and wait, uh, it's not going to happen. 
And for that reason, we know that at the first place, and this is part of the commitments that we call uh, the society and the customer first, we have to act internally. We, can only, we, we cannot wait the policymakers to give us all the conditions that are right. If it's not us acting, we will have the difficulties uh, to convince our customers that we are attractive and also price competitive. So here you see the, the commitments of the railways before we talk about what we expect from the policymakers. In the first place, it's how we structure our businesses, how we are we becoming more innovative, how we are becoming really the partner to our customer in the whole mobility chain. And not nationally only, but especially across the border, since we have more than 50% of the freight businesses international. So that's what we, what we have to retain. And on top of that, we will also have to innovate in order to be still the most sustainable and the green transport in, in Europe or globally. And that's, that's a really big challenge because we know very well what is, what is road doing. And they are also going towards the more sustainable solutions. So we, we shall not sleep. It will, it will cost us some investments, but we have to move in order to keep what, what is on the right side of the slide. The advantages that are simply given by the technology, by the laws of physics of the railway, that is saying clearly that we are five times more energy efficient than the road is just because we are rolling the iron on iron. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's very efficient, but we have to use it to the full capacity. So we have the potential and we have to work on that and we will, if we collectively, of course, commit to it. Now I say that we, of course, will not stop you because we still need something from the policymakers, certainly. And there are a few topics that need to be mentioned before we switch and move just to the money. Uh, it's a level playing field. And again, I have to quote Henrik Hololei. I'm really pleased. I mean, I probably had to record this, your speech, Henrik. <laughs> the internalization of external costs. Polluter pay principle. If there is something that could balance the, the view on the individual transport modes from the perspective of the customer, it is, of course, the cost structure. And it's, of, it's not only about the customers, it's, it's in the first place maybe about the society. Why should be society, through the taxes, through the, all the insurances, be paying for the costs cost incurred by the, by the transportation? No. It's not the society who should bear this burden. It should be the user of the transport and the transportation companies. So let's put the right thing right. And this internalization of external cost is the principle that simply has to apply systematically. And now again, it's a plea to all of you. Please try to convince your representatives in the government, so the Ministry for Transport, Ministry of Finance, that we need to put this instrument in place. And it's the right time to do so because we still have the mobility package open in Brussels. So we can still push for it. We know that our negotiating position is not very easy, but if we don't push all collectively, then at the end of the day, it will be the society that will not enjoy the, the benefits from the mobility, but will be, will be simply affected negatively. The same applies to the European Parliament, but here, here I have to say we have been always re, uh, uh, receiving the good support. So I can only thank Mr. Sarvama and the others, because from the Parliament it not all went well. We need the support from the member states. Then it's, uh, it's not about the, uh, the, uh, the, the level playing field only, it's about how we foster the financing of the research as well. Because we need to innovate, I mentioned it on the previous slides. So I'll be more than happy to see also the support collectively from the policy making actors that we have uh, enough resources for the, for the financing of the, of the research and innovation. Why so? Because not only it will make the Europe, European economy bigger and, and, and much stronger, but we will be also growing against the other regions of the world, and we need to be competitive globally. And that's the part of the business which, which pays. Someone has mentioned this morning the Siemens and Alstom in completely different circumstances, but it is about how we also make our industry very strong globally and competitive. And of course, the last thing is, and it, it's how the storyline will continue, about the financing of the infrastructure. All that you can find uh, also what, uh, in the CR policy agenda that I said that it's called the customer and society first. So I can only encourage you to, to download the document. And if you've been interested to work with us on promoting these challenges, the, these challenges that we have for the next five years, because they're essential, as I said, for all of us, not for the individuals, but for whole society. 
Now, a lot has been said about the Connect Europe facility, and I can only thank both the European Commission as well as the European Parliament for the support provided, because we know very well that from the CEF in the current financing period, we have received a lot already, and we have benefited quite, quite a lot. Here, just one signal back to the individual member states. This is the picture when presented that everyone said, yes, good, but how it is with the distribution of the funds uh, in the individual states? And I must say, not at all that positive, because if you receive some 70% of the transportation funding directly to the railway, when you go to the Central uh, Eastern European states, CEC, or if you wish, the new member states, then the ratio of the financing between the road and the rail is 85% uh, to road, 15% to rail only. So, and this is what we feel, it's not only critical today, and this is for the current period of the time, and also the last uh, the, more than 10 years, but this is what will become critical in future. We can't simply rely only on the money that are going to be uh, sent or allocated uh, by the European Union. We really have to do a much more, a lot more, convincing the policymakers on the national level there is a need to rebalance the financing of the infrastructure between the road and rail in order, again, to provide certain necessary capacity and quality for the future of the, of the rail, for the future of green mobility and, again, society. What else? Uh, this is the future. Or at least this is how the, how the Commission has seen the future, and we've been happy to see that, and we've been even more happy, what Mr. Sarama has said already, that the Parliament has been even pushing for more than this. Just uh, if uh, Jean-Louis Colson allows me about this military part. Hmm? Uh, we, of course, have certain expectations, but we would be more than happy if the expectations of the NATO or the military services are really close to what we can do, because uh, ideally, and you mentioned it yourself, if you talk about the dual military civilian use, it's more or less what then Rail Baltica is going to apply for, a, for the different philosophy of the dual use, which is the heavy freight and the high speed. If you are going to deviate from, the, uh, from what is now being designed for the Rail Baltica for 25 tons and 120 kilometers or 140 kilometers per hour for the freight train and go for something else, not only we will not be uh, eligible, but we will have to prob we have a problem to accommodate this, this expectation anywhere else. So what I would be very much pleased to see, and we have been, by the way, promised by the Commission, that we will, we will be consulted for those, uh, for those requirements. So it's not only run, you know, somewhere in the background. I mean, Henrik is not happy to hear that, but I'm, I'm just saying that we have been promised that. So I hope that we will get it, that we, we can have a look at it and we can give also our view on that as the business, because I said that this is what we are going to represent also in the future. So uh, I mentioned the infrastructure, I sh and I also s spent a few words about the research. What we also need to do, and I believe the the whole railway will uh, benefit from it, and Rail Baltica as well. We need to continue the innovation research budget. So we need also to continue the shift to rail in a, I would say, follow-up, or what we call the shift to rail too. So again, please help us, and I believe that we are on the right track, but let's be sure that we have the right allocation also for the shift to rail too. We are jointly with, with Philip uh, pushing, Philip Citroen uh, from UNIFE, pushing for really ensuring that the businesses are fully behind, there is a full commitment of the rail sector that we will, we will receive also in the future, the budget that is essential after 2021. Now, last words, because we talk a lot about the Rail Baltica, but obviously we need to see the rail infrastructure investments in a much bigger dimensions. What are the benefits? And I believe that this is something, again, if, it's, if I spoke about the relatively low support coming from the member states, individual member states for the rail investments, this is what needs to be understood and uh, somehow sold at the first place. The, the investments to the rail bring essential benefits. They may be costly, but they bring a lot of benefits. And those benefits uh, just limited to the nine corridors, you can see them here. Whether it's about the, uh, the additional GDP, whether it's additional uh, uh, employment, whether it's, uh, whether it's the savings of the CO2 emissions, so the greening the transportation, that is a lot what the rail investments will bring 
compared to what the investments to the other transport mode, maybe with an exception of the inland waterways, can do for, for the society. And this is the element that we need probably to pronounce even more in future, that uh, it's not a sunk money if you invest to the railway, but it's a money that will bring the huge benefits for the society in the future. But it, as I said, it not only needs to be understood in, in, the, in, in Brussels, which is more or less the job done. It needs to be understood on the local level, much more than it is today. Some individual projects, which I'm sure that about them most of you have heard already, Brenner Base Tunnel, the project that is, will cost uh, almost uh, 9 billion of euro, but already what we see are the huge benefits that it's going to, uh, going to produce as soon as deliver, and the benefits with regards to the extra DGP are multifold. That's, it's, you know, it's about more than 100 billion of euro which is going to bring it until 2030 when they complete it. We will have uh, two thirds of the travel time for the passenger, uh, passenger services across the Brenner, which is uh, connecting Austria and Italy, but not only because it's connecting the central, central Europe with, uh, with, the, with the Italian ports. And we will have additional jobs created due to that, due to, thanks to that. Another project, the, the high-speed uh, uh, Dresden Praha, finally approved by the German federal government a few years ago. This is again essential link which will cut by half the travel time between the cities. It will provide additional capacity, it will provide also the capacity for freight, and again the, the uh, the incomes, the, I would say the, uh, the, the, the revenues from the services and the, and the overall benefits will overweight by and large the, the, the original investments made. So there is always a good opportunity to continue the, the projects like that one, especially in the cross-border dimension. Another one, Fenmar Belt, fixed link. This is, this is an enormous construction bringing a lot of benefits, just saying that instead of traveling 160 kilometers, you will be in five minutes crossing the border between Denmark and Germany. So everybody will understand that this is something which is, of course, of the huge importance for the whole Europe. And again, it will bring the, G the extra DG GDP. It will boost the economy of Europe. And that's the reason why we, as the railway, are always behind that, including, obviously, and I don't think that I need to explain more, about Rail Baltica, which is another connector that will bring additional uh, additional benefits for the whole society, not only of the Baltic states, not only of Finland and Poland, but the European Union uh, people as such. So finally, if you put all those segments, components together, so the financing of the infrastructure, setting the right conditions for the competitiveness of rail a, a, amongst the transportation modes, so this mentioned polluter prey principle and, and other factors, innovating the railways, and in also in a in multimodal context, which is the internal role of the railway, then we can be some, some, uh, much closer to the target that has been set by the uh, leading CEOs of the rail freight companies in Europe. Let's achieve the target, which has been even set by the white paper of the commission in 2011, 30% of the market share of the railway on the principal uh, connections in Europe, so the, the uh, the distance is over 300 kilometers, 30% of the market share by 2030. What it will mean, or what it, will, what it needs to mean when, uh, when we talk about the 30% market share is doubling the volumes transported by rail. Doubling the volumes. So it's clear that it is not an easy exercise, but it will bring a lot of savings to the society. Economic gain, a lot of savings to the environment, uh, it will be also saving the lives. And this is probably something on top of what we have been discussing so far, which needs to be well pronounced towards the local governments and the society. We as a railway will help you to save the lives if you invest to the railway, because you will have a less death on the roadside. And here it's calculated, and not by us in fact, up to 40,000 premature deaths due to the pollution and 5,000 fatalities. So let's Let's work together with that, uh, on that. Let's have this, this target in, in mind that if we work collectively and if we have the right investment on one side and the right innovation on the other side, we can, we can be closer to reaching this target of 30% uh, uh, of the market share by 2030 on top of what has been set, which brings the additional benefits, of course, for the customers on the passenger side when the, when the high-speed rail links are built and connecting the capitals of Europe. Thank you very much for your attention.